right? So let's say this is x and density that we can tune. Simply that as you increase x and density, that this, uh, the Bose-Einstein condensation temperature simply increases. If you just kind of using the simple mean field argument, you can easily understand. However, if the if you increase the excellent density too much, there are interesting things happen. Even for the without, without any condensation, what happens is if the excellent excellent distance is too close compared with the, the uh, electron hole separation, eventually electrons and holes start to screen each other. So excellent start can unbind uh, such that even eventually this excellent gas will turn into the separate electron hole gases or their bubbles and those kind of things. And that is what we call the so-called mode transitions of the semi-classical limits. Very similar way, even for the condensation of the Bose-Einstein condensation, as you increase the excellent density, you expect that this BEC turn into the more separate condensation of electron hole, in other words, the BCS limits of the, this thing. So this type of the language has been discussed in the cold atom communities, and you can naturally see that there is a nice crossover you can see between the BC and BCS. Of course, this language needs to be translated when we go into the, this, um, the magnet extons. In magnet extant case that I just mentioned, that the extant size is it fixed by just the separation between two layers. But extant, extant distance can be controlled simply by the magnetic field because uh, this distance is governed by the distance between cyclotron orbits, which actually is related with the magnetic length of the system, which can be tunable by the magnetic field. So in a sense, when you have the, this magnetic extant condensation, there is a natural knob so you can tune around. One is, of course, temperature, but the other one is basically a magnetic field, which in principle control the excellent densities. Right? With these pictures that you can just kind of view following things, right? We can just kind of do that. Uh, sorry, that uh, very similar things also appears not only in new called the zero that, uh, but any of this magnetic excellent condensation start to show a very similar thing. Of course, in the finite density uh, magnetic excellent condensation, new called new total equal one, uh, then you can measure both xx and xy of the counter flow geometry of the resistance. To make the long story short, if you just measure all the TCs here, then you start to see the recover again this type of dome like the shape of the, this, uh, the condensation temperature and clearly see that those kind of things about the BC and BCS of the crossover seems like they also can be realized into any of the magnet actions uh, just we can create. It. So it tells us that indeed we have the good controls of uh, that, right? So I'm almost running out of my time. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. So, I mean, uh, there you have this exciting insulating kind of behavior, yeah. and that you refer to the condensation. Yes. So, how do you define mot insulator? I, I didn't get that. Mot insulator behavior, we have not seen in these pictures, right? Um, it is, uh, again, um, one has to be a little bit careful because I, the ex, well, this I call, carefully call this magnetic extons, right? So it's not the real extant I was yeah. talking about, okay. right? So I think there is a certain limits that I can take. Okay, multi insulator behavior is not there, but uh, the behavior of multi insulator, if we just call, is something related with this line, right? Because uh, this is basically, if you look at this, uh, before you hit the condensation, yeah. right? So the crossover is related with the mod, uh, mod transitions, right? Uh, mod transition, not multi insulator, by the way. So. Mott transition means that uh, Mott did a lot of important work, and of course, Mott meta insulator transition is an important part, but Mott transition in the external is different stories. Okay, Mott transition external is basically external gas becomes spontaneous unbound ele the, to electron and hole gases together when external density is, uh, increases. The experimental evidence here is basically a little bit analogical, so I'm not, I don't want to claim that this is a really mild transition at this point, but it's a related physics there. And part of the, these reasons that I have to keep using the analogy here yes. is it's not real externs, right? So if you just allow me to spend another, say, 10 minutes, Yes, right. Sure. And I can tell you a little bit of the stories in that direction. Now, uh, if you make the complaints by now, and I, my talk title contains about the electrons and optoelectronics, electronics and optoelectronic properties. But I mentioned there are all these extons in terms of magnetic analysis, but there is no lights. 
right? So where is that optoelectronics really going on? And part of the reason that there is no optoelectronics yet is all the story I just mentioned here is still graphene, that we create the magnetic and analogies. So to get into the really optoelectronic part, I did a semiconductor step, right? And I mentioned that's a two-dimensional electron, uh, uh, two, uh, the, the transition metal, uh, the metal dye charcoal genide actually is a great system as a two-dimensional semiconductors. And indeed, the study shows that when you shine the lights, they can create the extons in there. And this exton is quite intriguing in a sense because the electron hole pairs in the creating the single, uh, the uh, two-dimensional layers, their field line is escaping out from this metal. They're really strongly bound. So uh, if you, in all these kind of studies in the other groups, indicating that you create the extons by the shine the light, their binding energy is very strong. And they are chiral in a sense that because the spin and orbit couplings, uh, strong spin orbit couplings, and uh, spin value locking at the, the band, uh, the brilliant zone edges, make that this is a rather intriguing system. So I told you that we can make the device out of this two-dimensional electron system, which means that uh, not only you can just make this electrical transport, you can just do this optical spectroscopies. An important part is that this optical spectroscopies tells us that using this uh, gate that tied with the source electron, uh, source drain electro voltages, you can tune around the optical spectrum of this, uh, the exton you created or charged exton you created. They are all kind of gate tunable, right? Because of the lack of the time, I don't want to dwell on this, all of these things, but careful studies start to tell us not only the photo, uh, not only that uh, uh, photoluminescent, in other words, the emissions you are getting out of this, but also absorption you can get um, from this one, uh, samples can be all gate tunable and depends on the whether you get the P type or N type, uh, you get quite kind of different type of the spectrum tunabilities uh, by gate voltages. So I think that that's kind of good stories. But I want to actually tie back the stories with this interlay action I was talking about. Another five minutes, sorry, right? If you just choose a P and N type of a semiconductor and put them together, you can create this uh, very similar quantum wave structures I was talking about before, right? And, and then they are actually disconnected and naturally make the type two semiconductors by just choosing the right, uh, the, uh, the semiconductor combination. In this particular case, it's moly diselenide and tungsten diselenide. Shine the light, you can create the exon in each of the layer, but then that exon quickly dissociated and create this so-called interlay exons. Uh, one holds, uh, whole electron leaving here, whole leaves on the other layers, and you can create the interlay extons. So not only this cartoon, you can create the devices, and uh, once you have the, this heterostructure device, and indiv all individual layers are gain contact, and we have the top and bottom gates control each of the layer, like the graphene device I mentioned, simply that, but replacing the one of the graphene to the P-type materials and the other materials, N-type materials, you can shine the light, you start to see that photo emission, uh, photo luminescence start to show that in this overlap re regimes, much smaller energy scale of the this emission, indicating that we can create this interlay extons, right? And this is a real extons, right? And the interesting part is this interlay exton can be controlled in many ways. For example, if I just apply the bias voltage across the, this layer, electric field, this interlay exton energy can be tuned. Uh, quite linearly, simply it's a linear stack effect because the electric field is along the direction of the electric field. You can tune this energy scale linearly, and more importantly, their lifetime can be tunable. And especially when you start to kind of pull these electron holes away by applying the electric field, your lifetime becomes longer and longer and reach almost half microseconds. This lifetime is almost a three order magnitude longer than lifetime of the exon you create in one of the layer, right? So we have the long lifetime because of this exon electrons holes in the different layer. It's a difficult to kind of bind them together, uh, recombine to energy, get the energy back. And such a long lifetime is a first ingredient we need to create exon condensations, right? We don't get the exon condensation yet, but uh, we can start to get the kind of interesting things. For example, since it's a long-lived exon, when you shine the lights in one of the spots, create these extons, and then uh, this is a photoluminescent map showing that how the exon is distributed. You start to see the exon is quickly just uh, dispersed out of your sample. 
If you just do the, this time, res, res, uh, time, uh, time dependent measurement, you can see the external start kind of diffuse out along these uh, directions, and that from the diffusion, you can get the information about how fast this external diffuses, and external diffusion constant, uh, diffusion coefficient is a very uh, respectable numbers, and actually related well with this. Um, the uh, mobility of the carry, individual carrier in this system tells us that we start to see that this axon created can be readily just can be diffused out and create enough the densities. If you look at this sample carefully, there are a lot of the, um, the local bright spots indicating that axon may be just trapped in these spots. We don't have yet the really microscopic view that why there is axon traps there, but clearly that this local spot that axon get the higher density and they have the longer lifetime, so we know there's a, this trap is possible. More important part is that once it's a trapped axon, their lifetime becomes even longer. And um, when you just kind of look at this, uh, the energy shift to axons, because the axon's density becomes larger, then axon axon interactions boost up the axon energies. And from that, the energy shift in the, uh, with the power or number of axon we pumped in, we can estimate that what is the axon density is there. And the axon density is something like the range of the 10 to the 11 axon per square centimeter once it's a trapped. And this is again the quite important density because you see that to create the axon condensation, I need a higher density, right? Simply just using simple the, the mean field type of the approximation, uh, this density that corresponds to the, the, the TC uh, of the Bose-Einstein condensation is something like the range of the few Kelvin. So we believe that we are getting very close to condensation, although we don't have the proof. Another exciting part is it's not only the light that you can create externs. In fact, in this case, that we have the context everywhere, right? You can pump in the electron hole, not through the light, but through the electrode, right? So basically, just kind of uh, just applying this biased voltage, positive and negative bias voltages, and try to pump in the electron hole. You can create these extons, and the evidence is basically we start to see the light emission. Basically, this is what you call electroluminescent. You can think about this as a light emitting diode, right? And by controlling the gate voltages and analyzing this, the, uh, the spectrum of the light, we know that this light that we're getting out by injecting in a hole has the same structures as uh, the interlay exon we just mentioned before. So, which is good, and their lifetime and their energy is exactly controllable by the gate voltages. So that's another way. So the nutshell here is, although we don't yet have the really good control of the uh, uh, evidence of the axon condensation, we are getting there. We have the, a lot of control that we can realize onto the, this interlayer, uh, bilayer system uh, with electrical means. Now, on the top of that, now I want kind of looping back before I just close on the one important part. I told you that we can also confine the charges into the system, right, by just local gate. So indeed, we can combine those kind of local the confinement by just local gate with optoelectronics I just demonstrated, right? On those kind of the local the gate structure, we can create this the quantum dot connected with the other uh, or an electron drain, so we can see the transport is happening. But importantly, when you just look at this uh, optical spectrum, especially localized there, there is the uh, additional peak appears coming from this charge confinement in the system, tells us that indeed we can probably manipulate it, those kind of the uh, optical spectrum coming from the spots. Indeed, if you just look at this uh, local spectroscopy maps, you can see that whenever you have the charge confinement, there's a peaks appears that correspond to charge axon peaks. Note that axon is neutral, so I cannot simply combine it by simply electrostatics, but at least charge the extons, uh, we can just kind of combine and make the localized spectrums and so on, right? Not only spots, if you make the one-dimensional structure, you can just combine those kind of uh, spectrums in the, the one-d confined structures. And all of these things start to tell us we can just kind of get some of the engineering in the system, right? So where are we are going? So we have the ample evidence now, at least in the magnet axon, we have to really create this and many body effects. The next step is, can we actually do that in the real extons? And at least technology-wise, we get kind of initial few steps, right? We know that interlay can exist and they are long-lived, and we know that how to they control them, 
right? So the eventually, if you just kind of build up the trap for the excitons by just applying the, uh, somehow localizing your electric field in certain uh, local positions, we believe that we should be able to create this, those kind of excitons traps. We can increase excitons density even further by just engineering. So that's kind of the direction we are going. All right, with that, I want to kind of thank your attention. And uh, I, I want to again thank the, the, uh, uh, my students and collaborators for that to make the, these talks happen. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, in the magnetic magneto excitons yeah. in the field that you were showing. Uh, so when you are at half half field landau, like yeah. that, this of course shows the static right. How robust is it to going away from half like one minute? Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a reasonably robust. I think um, so it depends on the little bit detail, but uh so it might have number. Uh, I think uh, probably say 25% to the 75% of the imbalance, I think that they can be robust. Half and half, I think, maybe a little bit smaller, but at least uh, the, um, if you guys have the nuco one, I think that's what we have. Okay, so uh, what is the data I can show you? Maybe I can show you uh, this, right? Basically, if you just take that this zero range is my this one, it's not a one point, but it's actually a, a spread ranges. So if I just look at this across somewhere there, uh, you can see that kind of zero, and that's a range of say 25 percent to 75. Yeah, so there is some stability. So it doesn't have to be exactly half and half, right? Yeah. yeah. So why does HPN encapsulation improve the quality of the? Right. So uh, the. Scenario is the following thing. So we, uh, without encapsulation, before that we can just put the silicon oxide and the typical substrate. What happened is that on the substrate, uh, that usually in the three-dimensional bulk substrate, we cut it off. There's a dangling bond. And you have to somehow saturate it off with some things, right? So it's not really atomically well characterized, uh, the substrate. And furthermore, um, any dangling bond, if there is, it is a good place that you can trap the charges. Right. So uh, typical substrate you have, 